great. Welcome. Welcome to all you who've logged on already. That's great. Lovely to see your names, at least. Thanks for joining us today. It's really exciting. First, first event of a few for our book. And um, yeah, really excited to to have our speakers here. Um, so we've got Dr. Keston Perry, Kumal Rambaroof Hertz, and Michelle um, Goren. Oh, sorry, can you pronounce your name for me, please, Michelle? I didn't ask you that, sorry. Uh, no, no problem. It's Grunewald, but really don't worry about it. Okay, Michelle Grunewald. Thank you. Okay, so whilst um, we'll just, we'll give people, you know, about half minute, a minute to turn up. Can you put in the chat uh, where you're from? It's always really exciting to see where people are calling in from. Okay, Antwerp. Thank you, Eddie. Nice to see your name there. South Africa, Colombia. Oh, exciting. It's just nice because then I can imagine I'm somewhere else when I see all countries. And I'm not in Manchester and it's cold. Well, not as cold today, but it's dark anyway now and it's winter. Okay. Great. Wow. Good mix coming through. Okay, so whilst uh, there's lots of people coming through, so we'll make a start because we have got quite a lot to get through. So I'll just run through what we'll be doing today in this webinar. So obviously it's about our book, Reclaiming Economics for Future Generations. So we've got three speakers today, two of whom contributed to that book, so I'll introduce them later. And um, we've got one speaker, Dr. Kesson Perry, who for me certainly... It, um, certainly introduced to me a lot of new ideas about um, how to look at economics in a different way in terms of what he does. So, get a bit of feedback on here, it's a bit annoying. Um, okay. So, yeah, so we'll have to, uh, yeah, so we'll hear this from the three speakers and well, the first thing we're going to do is actually have a, a group activity on chat so you guys can then uh, give some answers on chat so I'll, we'll put that in the chat later then I'll give you a bit of a short background to the book so why we're we here today where did it come from okay so I'm just sorting out my feedback so thank you very much you suggested that good person somebody's on the tech today thank you for that okay so um it's very confusing trying to work that out so after we hear from the speakers three speakers so they'll each have 10 minutes and we'll go straight into the q a section so you guys can answer ask them questions so when something comes up when they're speaking please put the question in the q a tab so it's at the bottom off the screen and also what's at the bottom is there's a live translation in Spanish so if you go to that bottom of the screen um, bottom right you can click on the icon there and there'll be a live translator there in Spanish okay so as well as putting the questions and answers um, in the tab you can upvote them so if you want certain questions answered um, more than others then please add your vote by putting your thumbs up really on there okay and just a quick reminder, you know, it's, we're trying to create a space, safe space here. So, and I'm pretty sure everyone here will you know, you'll use respectful language when writing in the chat and on the Q and A tab. I'm total confidence you're going to do that. And we're going to have a really good webinar today. Okay. So, first of all, before I go on to the book and then go into the speakers, just a short activity for you to post into the chat. So just anything that comes in your first, you know, your first thoughts when you hear what I say, anything at all. Um, what do you see when you think of the words economists and economics? So what or who do you see 
when you think of the words economists and economics. So just put your answers in the chat, please. Interesting. White males in grey suits, Chris has put here. Not in touch with the ecosystem. Old man, grey suit, boring. <laughs> well, after today, they'll certainly hear economists who aren't boring. <laughs> Arrogance. A standard Asian white male, right? Adam Smith, conservative white man from Chicago school, Krugman. Yep, we we had a talk about him in our diversifying and decolonizing circle today. Great, thank you. Thanks for those. That's really good. Well, yeah, men, yes. Okay, supply and demand. Well, I'm so well, I, I like I don't really want to say I'm glad you said that, but I'm gonna say I'm glad you said that because this is exactly why we decided to write this book. Because we had heard from from some of you guys, you know, students that were telling us um you know economics it doesn't represent a multitude of identities in terms of who does the teaching who learns it who who is represented in the discipline who is represented in the content of the discipline and so when we began research for this book it uh, we were quite shocked by the commonality so there were um, some students in, in economics did some really great interviewing with their peers who were from underrepresented groups in the discipline and there were just some themes that came out and also there was this realization there's a cultural problem in economics there's a systemic problem that means that you know that not everyone's voices and lifestyles and, and positions are heard from and but for us it's not just a case of having tokenistic change like having you know that woman in the economics department or having more black scholars in in departments you know what we really believe is that to reclaim economics and reform it we need to diversify decolonize and as well as democratize it so those first two d's diversifying and decolonizing is what some of the speakers will be talking about a bit today um and so, so yes, yeah, so the first one we'll have is Dr. Keston Perry, who um, is currently in the US. He's an assistant professor of Williams College in the US. And his work shines a light on the ways in which uh, global institutions and governance further expose black and racialized communities in the Caribbean to acute dispossession, debt, and death within the context of the climate crisis and dr perry makes the case for climate reparations now while dr perry didn't contribute to our book as i said before i think the the approach this really new approach in economics ones we don't really hear of it really influenced some of the things we were writing about and, and resonated with some of the research we found so dr keston perry it's over to you thank you for 10 minutes Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Nicola and fellow panelists. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to everyone who is here with us uh, from all around the world. I am amazed to see the number of um, people from and the locations. I mean, this virtual engagement enables us, us to do this kind of thing, which is really, really um, unique and, and special. I wanted to say a, cu a couple words about uh, the book in that I found it's very, very helpful. And there was not a resource such as this one that, that you yourself, Nicola, and your, your co-editors, as well as the, the rest of the Re Rethinking Economics team has worked on to with which people of color and people of minoritized and marginalized communities who might be in, interested in economics, who engage in economics every day, in their everyday, in, their, uh, in, in how they purchase, act as a consumer, in terms of how they take care of their family, in terms of how they um, do housework and, and various forms of activity that are economic uh, in nature, but themselves may, based on how economics has structured 
or has been historically structured and has been ex exclusive or, or has excluded underrepresented groups would not have uh, such a resource. So I'm really, really grateful for this particular resource. And I'm really grateful for, for some of the ex very exciting uh, and, and very interesting work that yourself, Nicola, and, and others at Rethinking uh, is, is doing. Uh, in terms of, of what the brief I was asked to look at, and, and when I thought about the questions that, that, that were posed to me, I was wondering how honest should I be? <laughs> and, and how, um, you know, what, what would be um, some of the things that I should say about one, democratizing economics, and on the other hand, as a black queer person from the Caribbean, from the global South, what are some of the challenges I myself have, have, have faced um, as a result of, of being an, a part of the economics department, doing my PhD among uh, e economists, especially in, in a development studies department, but also the core of my work is, is of the core of uh, my doctoral work has been on uh, institutional economics and, and, and technology and in industrial policy. So taking all that into account, I think to understand where we're at in terms of the mainstream of economics and to understand what are the questions, concerns, and what are the things that are left out from that particular uh, canon we have to sort of consider first off the history of economics as a field where uh, philosophers, so at the time when economics was being formulated as a field, it was not called economics. It was called, uh, it, was, it was referred to as a scientific field. So people like um, Adam Smith were referred to as philosophers and scientists. Uh, and and the, that history is very important for us to understand, it came from a very elite perspective on society, one that was not grounded in everyday people's concerns, right? So the, the, the sort of typical uh, archetype of economists that, that many people have referred to in the chat have, has been that white man, gray haired man dressed up in um, very um, formal or some form of uh, European Victorian style attire, right? And they were making judgments about market forces and, and society and so on from a vantage point which did not integrate very much with everyday people's concerns, right? And they were giving you, they were giving a lot of advice to uh, colonizers, people who, who were interested in, in voyages to other parts of the world, the new world. And the, many of their theoretical assumptions and ideas supported colonial conquest, right? So they, and I mean, when, when Adam Smith arrived at suggesting that slavery was not helpful for capitalism to progress, he was suggesting from the point of view, not that people should, enslaved people or enslaved Africans should be freed, but rather market forces were not optimal in the context of a uh, system of enslavement. So he was not unlike um, uh, other people like, like uh, Eric Williams and so on, he was, uh, Adam Smith was not interested in freedom very much. He was interested in how, how do we progress capitalism and how do we advance capitalism to meet the, uh, in many cases, to meet the demands for accumulation and, and wealth accumulation in the global north and in colonial powers, right? So when we talk about how do we change that system or how do we change or break from that particular origin or that the original concept of, of what it, economics, uh, how it came about, we have to think beyond the institutions themselves. We have to think that the academic institutions or the think tanks or the government policy institutions. 
we have to think about, and this is where the book is very, very helpful. We have to think about where do we meet people? How do we meet people in terms of meeting their everyday concerns? My, one of the, the major themes and concerns that I work on, such as climate change, takes a very different perspective of how we understand and meet people and not about how do we tweak markets or tweak in market instruments in order for capital to continue to accumulate, right? So th that is an example we can think about how do we can think about economics differently. So when we talk about, you know, wh when I have met people, uh, especially economists, they, and I, I tell them what I'm working on. So I attended, for instance, I've attended a few of the American Economics Association meetings when I tell people I'm working on issues of race, colonial history, and the importance of those, uh, those processes in terms of climate change and climate impacts, they're like, what? <laughs> what does that have to do with um, economics, right? So the first reaction is often one that you're not very serious. You're not a very serious fellow if that is how you're approaching this question. And it, 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 I remember in 2015, I was at a, a UK university. I was invited to give a seminar. And among the group, there was a group, group of heterodox economists mainly among the group, there was one person in the economics department. Most of the others were not in the economics department. And he mentioned to me, um, after I gave my presentation, talking about the Caribbean, talk about industrial policy and, and, and um, systems of innovation and so on. He mentioned to me, um, this does not make sense. He said, this was a white man. Um, he basically said, you know, you need to just start over your research because all of this is what you're saying, does not make sense. It's not what or how you should approach this particular concern. <laughs> so I was completely blindsided. So this was six, seven years ago. I was completely blindsided by that particular comment. And I, at the time, I did not have the tools to respond to him or, or, or how to um, understand what he was coming from. I mean, I spent three years on this research. You mean, what is this he's talking about? But I understood it came from a very patriarchal and almost a racist uh, approach to how um, first you respond and, 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 and just giving being polite to, to people you're, in, you're invited to, to give. But also, the, it's about the kind of arrogance and the kind of close closed uh, approach to how economics is both taught and, and concerns are researched. Another example I can give is when I was interviewing at uh, uh, an economics, for an economics position at a heterodox department, at a, a heterodox institution. And I was told, you know, you're not really an economist, you know? Um, you know, I was invited as part of three people uh, to be interviewed. Um, and I was so, I, you're not really an economist. That was also very, um, it was very jarring and very surprising to me. Um, given my first journal article was published in Cambridge Journal of Economics. So it was very, very interesting. Those kinds of experiences, people of color, minoritized uh, economists and uh, women and, and queer and, and, and non-gender non conforming people tend to meet in the economics profession. We're, we're seeing some form of that coming to the fore. I don't know if it's going to, there's going to be a reckoning, but we have to think about the origins of the field. And I think that has a lot of a lot to say about how uh, economists continue to privilege certain kinds of work, where the, that kind of work is published and where and how you approach that, the methodology you use to uh, undertake the work. 
So I think in order for us to sort of reclaim economics it, as, as a question, I think it's an open question as opposed to one that's closed and shut. We have to think about the origins, but also we have to think about how do we meet people where they are? That, that, that formulates the questions and formulates how we undertake the research that we want to. Great. Right. Thank you. Amazing. Yeah. So, so much of that resonated with so many of the interviews we had with professionals in economics. So I'm really glad you brought that to the fore. And thank you for your praise as well for, for parts of our books. Really appreciate that. Okay, so we'll go on to um, the next speaker. So Kamal Rambaruth Hurt. Uh, so some of you may know Kamal already. He is um, a co-founder and former chair of Rethinking Economics for Africa, otherwise known as RIFA, um, at Wits University in South Africa. He's been a prominent active member of the Rethinking Economics or RE movement while developing his expertise in economic policy and analysis in South Africa, Italy and France. So over to you, Kamal. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you uh, to the authors, everyone who contributed to the book. Thank you to the interviewees, students, to the teachers, administrators, uh, and especially to Nicola. Thank you very much. Um, this book is long overdue, and it's an important contribution, I think, to making economics a more, a more honest discipline um, in line with what Dr. Perry was saying earlier. Um, and I mean, just to frame it a little bit and uh, to sell the book, <laughs> Uh, the aim of this book is to be part of a broader movement to kind of deepen this discourse around decolonizing, diversifying and democratizing economics um, and to present the problems honestly. Uh, there's a big effort here to underpin all of the critiques with some solid qualitative evidence. Um, and I must say, uh, Dr. Perry is asking if there will be a reckoning, and I think that this is, you know, one step in that direction, right? Um, the river that we're crossing towards a reckoning, uh, it's a large river, <laughs> and it can be brutal. Uh, but, you know, among these strong currents, uh, we try to offer in this book some pebbles, you know, some, some stones. Uh, and these stones come in the form of recommendations and ideas um, about, you know, some past successes in different parts of the world and also about potential actions uh, that can make a, a meaningful impact uh, both within uh, the bounds of the university and outside of it. Um, I think that, yeah, this book uh, begins the process of uh, uh, laying the stones that we can use to, to cross this river. Um, and, I mean... Just thinking about, you know, some of the challenges you face uh, as students, and I mean, that's really the perspective from which I speak, um, you know, uh, you know, thinking about overcoming a lot of these challenges and uh, how the rethinking economics uh, movement can assist you in, in doing so. Um, I think that, you know, in, in trying to reform any system, um, there will be constraints. You often feel like you're going up against this tide of gatekeepers, of difficult personalities, of people in positions of power who disagree with you. And sometimes even people who might not disagree with you, but are so kind of stuck and so, uh, you know, adrift in what feels like this never ending tide of, of orthodoxy. Um, and of course, there's no single solution to facing these challenges. Uh, but there are a few ingredients that I would say to students are, are, are very useful in, in kind of challenging orthodoxy, right? Um, the one is, you know, really pushing and pumping a lot of energy into making teams to run campaigns, right? Um, that's a, a vital ingredient, you know, um, organizing. Um, and when doing this, when, you know, making teams and running campaigns and organizing, understanding that the transformation uh, that's necessary extends beyond you usually and your time at a given university. Um, and so really, you know, ensuring that your teams last in the generations that follow after you um, and kind of institutionalizing this movement is very important. Uh, I think a third thing that's really important is having clarity on the nature of the problem in your context. Um, because, yeah, I mean, what it means to uh, diversify or, you know, democratize or decolonize means different things in, in different social settings. 
Um, and so, you know, we, we should always avoid this, this, you know, one size fits all approach to solving these, these serious challenges. Um, and then the other thing is, I think that some, some, some student uh, movements think that, uh, believe that it's okay to just kind of see and have clarity and call out issues. Um, and this is important, it's very important, but I think that we might run the risk of being dishonest if we only understand the challenges without taking some kind of action, right? Um, and in taking this action, you know, the rethinking economics movement can help in a, a range of ways in creating and sustaining groups by offering guidance and skills and information and a broad kind of network internationally. Um, then there was another question that uh, Nicola asked me to speak on, and that was just speaking about, you know, the relationship between um, democratizing uh, uh, economics um, uh, and you know, the role that this plays uh, in society. Um, uh, and I think, I think that the fundamental uh, point here is that no democracy can thrive, uh, no society can drive any kind of pro progress if the individuals in that democracy are poorly informed or misinformed, right? Um, and I think that the rethinking economics movement historically has been challenging the misinformation right or, or in economics the fact that it's not pluralist it's a uh, kind of in many ways uh, colonized it's in many ways a uh, uh, kind of uh, doesn't apply to real world context um, and this is often like a misinformation that happens you know within universities but i think that there's a there's a broader question here that goes beyond the narrow halls of academia you know, democratizing uh, uh, economics and is improving uh, our, our very democracy. And it also means ensuring economic literacy um, in all communities outside of universities. And it means thinking about also reforming the rules uh, at the level of local government or at the level of, you know, a firm so that there's this kind of a, a blossoming of economic citizenry. Uh, and so that economic citizenry can thrive. Um, so I think that's 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 quite a, a key element in thinking about the relationship with, uh, between economics and democracy. Um, the chapter in the book uh, that I contributed to tries to kind of situate decolonizing economics in history and in theory that goes beyond the problem uh, of, of representation. Um, and it links principles of democracy, of freedom and of justice. Right, um, a decolonized economics is one that is accessible. It's an education that relates to the real world experiences and solutions in marginalized communities and, and in developing countries too. Um, I remember the story that I always tell is uh, when I was a second year uh, a student in my undergraduate, we got taught this labor market, right? Uh, the wage setting curve, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I was very, I felt very stupid uh, during the, the lecture because I, I, I didn't, I couldn't understand how this was, how, you know, the labor market worked and didn't make sense. And it was very frustrating. And so I went to the lecturer after the class and I said, hey, um, you know, this doesn't make sense for me. You know, this, this labor market you're presenting says nothing about uh, uh, wage discrimination between unionized and non-unionized work workers. It says nothing about the gender wage gap. It says nothing about employment bias based on racial and tribal identities. And there hasn't been a single case study that you've used to kind of apply it to the South African labor market. You know, what's going on here? Uh, and her answer was, uh, was, was, was a bit scary. She was like, yeah, you're right. Um, you're right. Those critiques are all right. Um, and, and then it's kind of like, you know, if I'm, if I'm right, why are we teaching this, this stuff? Um, and her response was, was, was quite scary. Her response was that, you know, if you don't teach this stuff, you know, what happens if you go to a, a prestigious university overseas? You know, what if you go to, you know, Harvard or, or Oxford and you haven't done these basics? Uh, and this really made me mad because I don't want to learn basics uh, of models that don't apply to my context, that don't apply to solving the real problems that we face. Uh, in South Africa, for example, inequality, which is the highest in the world, um, more than half of uh, the youth working population is unemployed. You know, gender inequality continues to exclude women from the economy. And in, in many curricula, these kinds of issues are not studied at all. And in my case, they weren't even mentioned, uh, right? 
Uh, and so, you know, you, you, you get these two kind of uh, versions of reality, one in the textbook and one in your real life. And I mean, this book isn't, uh, uh, isn't kind of called uh, how, to escape co how to Escape Cognitive Dissonance or Dodging Double Consciousness, but that's really one of the sources of the critique. Um, many Black students in South Africa uh, are, say, you know, hey, this curriculum does not reflect the value systems and the cultural framework from which I come. Uh, for example, what's the relationship between a profit-maximizing individual whose utility is maximized through individual gain and exploitation as taught, taught by Economics 101, when the same student comes from a school or goes to a home where they're taught muntu ngu, muntu gabant, uh, that, that forwards social values whereby a person is a person through other people. Um, so there's clearly this crevice between the value system of many uh, 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 Black African students uh, and that of a liberal individualism that purports individuals to be entirely self-interested, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so just to finish off, uh, in 2019, we did a workshop uh, with uh, Rethinking Economics for Africa groups around the country um, on what a decolonized economics curriculum is. And I just quickly want to read you one of the responses of, of the groups. Um, let me just pull it up. So they said that um, a decolonized economics curriculum is one that is pluralist, relevant, and constructed to solve African problems in order to improve human development and the well being of Africans. It offers freedom, positive freedom, through the empowerment of students to have access to quality education. It has negative freedom through an international approach to theories and applications that places Africa at the center. This is a freedom from Eurocentricism. It is a curriculum that is enforced by institutions of education that are anti-racist, with these institutions playing a role in affirming African identities. Um, and while you might or might not agree with that, uh, that definition and you know, it, it, it is contested, the main point here is that our economy is embedded in our society, along with the entire range of challenges that stem from racial capitalism and colonialism. So surely our education about this economy should be embedded in the same reality. Thank you. Thank you. We interesting question to for people to maybe ask you questions back on in the q a so keep on putting those in thank you very much kamal um yeah things like pluralism uh, pluriversalism i should say comes to my mind when you say that it's no one shoe fits all when you want to decolonize and it should be place dependent and yeah just to yeah, that took that on board really. So yeah, please keep on asking your questions in the Q&A tab. Please don't forget to put the person, if there is a specific person you want to ask the question to put that in the tab as well. Um, and yeah, we're going to go on to the third uh, speaker, who is Michelle Gren Gronfold. And Michelle is also from South Africa. She lectures in economics at uh, Northwestern Northwest University and was awarded the Shevenin Scholarship and completed her master's in the political economy of development at SOAS, so the School of African, uh, sorry, Oriental and African Studies in London. And uh, after then she became the lecturer and she's also in the steering committee um, of the Diversifying and Decolonizing Economics Networks, and then called DECON. And they really helped us to develop some of the narrative for the book because they set up at the time we started doing our research. And Michelle is also a REFA member. So I'm just going to share her presentation um, as well on the screen. Okay, so over to you then, Michelle. Uh, thanks so much, Nicola. Uh, I just wanted to quickly double check. Um, should I share my presentation in order for me to be able to click through the slides? Uh, or is it okay? Will I still be able to uh, control the presentation if you've shared it? I, <laughs> I think hashtag 2020, but you're muted. Yeah, just tell me to, to click next. Just, yeah. Okay, sure thing. Uh, right. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you uh, so much uh, to everyone who's done so much work on this book. 
um, especially to the contributors um, and to you, Nicola, um, as well as to Joe and Lucy. And thank you so much um, to Dr. Perry for also joining us here today. Um, okay, uh, so uh, Nicola, I think we can move on to the first slide uh, in relation to um, positionality then. Uh, so I do just want to be very clear that obviously my positionality is going to color, influence and shape my understanding of the world. Um, and I'd really please like to emphasize that if any participant feels you know, that I've overstepped or misrepresented, I would really welcome being addressed on this. Um, much as the fact that I uh, was born and raised and have lived my whole life in South Africa, I am keenly aware of my whiteness and the privilege that comes along with that. Um, that has manifested in a myriad of ways. Um, and even if I have had to face some very uh, severe and real difficulties because of the fact uh, that I am female, um, that whiteness and that privilege uh, has given me massive advantages, um, especially in a country like South Africa. And I think that it's important for me to acknowledge that and reflect on that, uh, especially as I enter into my work uh, as a lecturer and within an economics faculty. I think uh, both Dr. Perry and Kamal have done an excellent job of emphasizing the colonial roots um, from which our economics discipline comes. Um, and so I will say that I've actively chosen to pursue an academic career in South Africa since returning from my master's um, at SOAS, as Nicola was saying. Uh, and um, this is despite the fact that I have been told uh, that I'm limiting my career, um, that I am going to be cutting off many opportunities for myself. And so I think that the book speaks quite strongly, actually, um, to why, with all of the best intentions, uh, people from uh, all across the world would tell me these types of things. Regardless, though, um, yes, I have chosen uh, to lecture um, and to build a career uh, here in South Africa. Um, and so I, I think since returning, I've also reflected a lot on the work of Sabelo Nglobu Khatsheni, uh, who I can really encourage anyone who's interested in um, post-colonial and decolonial scholarship to read some of his work. And when talking about African students continuing to make great tracks to Europe and North America for education to seek affirmation and validation of their knowledge, and um, I think this speaks very strongly to lots of what the book is discussing, is, uh, discussing in terms of knowledge production and knowledge dissemination, the Americanization of economics and the Eurocentrism that we find. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, so I just wanted to emphasize that what it might mean to reclaim economics has a lot for us to grapple with. And I think I have eight minutes left. So this is please just to emphasize that I have um, a really strong focus on economics curriculum reform and what it is that I'm presenting based on a little bit of what we discussed in chapter one and chapter six within the book. Um, but I really do want to emphasize um, in order to to really bring uh, to, to frame this and to foreground it with the very real reality that our curricula is embedded within higher education institutions, which needs to change, that we need to question what it even means. You know, when Kamal talks about the fact that um, we'll have half of our country um, in terms of youth unemployment um, being unemployed, but if it comes down to graduate unemployment, we only see about 11% uh, youth unemployment. So what does that mean and how do we unpack that? And then certainly these institutions are embedded in economies that need to change. And to try to divorce this from the broader society that we're all embedded in is simply not possible, even though I'm focusing on uh, curriculum reform today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, Nicola had asked us a couple of questions uh, on what we might potentially talk about. And one of them was what made me want to contribute to this book. Um, so let me be very clear. Uh, that I am certainly not advocating that simply adding scholars who have been marginalized is sufficient to be able to diversify, decolonize, or democratize economics. Um, but it is one important step in what I would really hope to emphasize without being prescriptive um, is part of a much larger process. Uh, and I would love for us to be able to discuss this perhaps more in the interactive uh, Q&A session. Um, but if I reflect on my first week um, in my very first year of my own economics class, I remember the lecturer being really enthusiastic to tell us about Smith and Marx and Keynes only. And that's where it stopped. Um, and so the question that I found myself asking as a first year economics student is, does this mean that white Western men can only be considered great economists? And when I looked around me in my class um, where there were... Uh, people from all races, um, ethnicities coming from many different walks of life um, and based within uh, the South African context, this led me to ask, can we not be great economists? Um, and so I don't think that um, these scholars don't have important insights, but I think Dr. Perry, for example, gave us a really great illustration of how we can teach the work of Adam Smith, for example, but teach it critically. And then not to have an or mentality where we replace one hegemony with another, but where instead of us saying, well, will we teach 
these scholars or these. I think we can approach this with an and approach um, for us to be able to teach more scholars who have been marginalized. Um, and so uh, really I try to reflect on this uh, in both chapter one and six of the book where now I find myself back at the same institution that I was as a first year. Um, and in my very first year of lecturing, I asked students if they could talk to me, if they could name for me um, a single female economist, or could they name for me a single African economist? Um, and students could not name um, a single one for me. And so these were uh, final year students that were going to graduate with a degree in economics. Uh, and so I suppose this is really what drove me uh, to contribute to this book. And so I have a question here, which, you know, we have a QA, and uh, a but that very much so puts us as speakers as like the fount of all knowledge. And I think part of the idea about democratizing this is not just for you to ask us questions and for us to be the fount of all knowledge, which I don't think any of us are espousing, um, but maybe you would be keen to share any of your experiences of how did you experience your introductory economics class? Um, next slide, please, Nicola. Uh, right, so what might change about economics education to help us reclaim this? So in chapter six, we talk a lot about diversifying, democratizing and decolonizing, but I do want to be very clear um, that uh, I draw strongly and I think uh, all of us in this book do draw strongly from the work of uh, previous uh, and current post-D and anti-colonial scholars. And I think um, this is an academic from New Zealand who speaks uh, really strongly and has informed a lot of my thinking and warning that we should use the word decolonization with extreme caution. Um, and speak perhaps initially of our attempts to diversify the syllabus and curriculum to digress, to decenter, to devalue, to disinvest, um, and to diminish some voices and opinions in meetings while magnifying others. And to really emphasize that um, it's all too easy for this to become a buzzword. Some would argue that it already has become this, um, but that this is a process, uh, that this needs to be context specific, um, and that this cannot simply be a tick box, that perhaps we require greater humility, something that economists are not particularly good at often, um, and that us debating what this concept might mean, acknowledging that it is a contested concept idea, um, that we can do so, and that we should hopefully be enthusiastic about that whilst still being critical, uh, so that we don't fall prey to this meaning everything and nothing. Um, well, next slide, please, Nicola. Um, so what might change about economics education to help reclaim it? I don't think that I have enough time to go into um, details here. So perhaps in the Q&A, we can talk more about this. But I would really emphasize asking whether students are genuine partners in this process, whilst acknowledging very importantly the very serious burden that students face in having to take on this type of activism, because many academics perhaps are unable or unwilling to do so. Um, but do we ask our students at the beginning of the semester, what about this curriculum doesn't look relevant or real or useful to you? Do we let students choose topics? Um, in my own limited experience and not to advocate that this is the only way to approach this, but when asking students whether they would like to um, pick a topic uh, that they can lecture uh, me in, uh, that they can teach their fellow peers about, Students want to choose things like Lobola and Stockfels and the cultural values that Kamal was talking about that just fly in the face of ideas about profit maximization and utility maximization. Um, and I wonder if it's too easy for us as academics to co-opt this process. Um, I, I think it's really important for us to emphasize the importance of knowledges, a word that is so strange apparently that if you type it into um, Microsoft Word, it's going to underline it for you in red. Um, and that we need to push back on something that you know you heard Dr. Perry being told himself, um, that this is just not economics. And maybe in a best case scenario, you're going to be told, oh, this is really interesting, but this is something that some other discipline might take a look at. Um, and that it's really fundamental for students and lecturers to engage on topics like power beyond just monopoly, uh, monopoly power. Um, history, slavery, colonialism, imperialism, and racism do not come up in very many economics courses um, that I have ever taken or um, desperately looked for online to see what others are teaching. Um, and breaking down this idea of neutrality, object, um, objectivity, and universality in economics. And much as I would advocate for pluralism, I do think that it's all too easy for it to become very Eurocentric and Americanized, and that we need to push back on that. Um, and then, yes, in just really emphasizing that it's not about being prescriptive and thinking through things being context specific, but hopefully trying to open up um, avenues for us to question, engage, and collaborate. Um, Nicola, next slide, please. Yeah, um, and then really just in closing, how might a change in economics be achieved? So acknowledging that economics curriculum reform is just with one part of it. Um, I use the example of us uh, talking about the informal economy, perhaps. Uh, who do we invite 
to talk about this? Do we invite an informal trader into our classroom or take our students outside of the classroom? Um, or is it just that we're going to have the latest economics article that's going to be trying to measure in extreme detail exactly how big is the informal economy? Um, to immerse ourselves in post anti decolonial contributions made by not just academics, but by activists, community members, um, by questioning what it even means to be an expert, um, to build connections to challenge injustices within the institutions of higher education, and then try to move beyond the boundaries of that ivory tower, uh, whilst acknowledging that there are very real repercussions to doing this type of work. Um, and hopefully more opportunity then to discuss this in the interactive session. And the very final slide then, um, if you can scroll to that one, thanks Nicola, it's just a quote uh, from the end of chapter six, which is one of the chapters that I had just um, worked on, because I think often we focus a lot on challenges and that is um, necessary and very important because there are sometimes, at least to me, they may seem insurmountable. But I think that um, a book like this uh, with the different connections uh, that get built because of something like this and the rethinking economics movement more broadly and RIFA more specifically, that ultimately um, we'd hope that you're excited by this process, that it's an opportunity for change, for innovation, for discovery, for a diversity of people and ideas and interdisciplinary approach in economics. Um, and even if there are enormous challenges, there also lies opportunity to have more of the lived experiences that both speakers have already spoken about today. Um, from a more diverse group of people reflected back at us in a way that encourages us to build and to construct anew. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Michelle. Yeah, just summing up some of the core suggestions that we make in the book, really informative. Um, so I'm not going to speak much because we've got quite a few questions um, that have been, yeah, posed in the the Q&A. So first of all, um, I'll just read them out because we are sort of running out of time. It'd be nice to get through some of these questions or as many as we can. Uh, so for Dr. Perry, um, Bendile has asked, well, said, thank you for sharing your reflections. Um, how do we practically engage people where they are? Um, thanks, Nicola. And thank you, Michelle and Kamal for very, very, very uh, insightful um, overviews, I think, of your, your own contributions. Uh, I think it's about becoming uncomfortable with your everyday, right? So, so meeting people uh, outside of your comfort zone, outside of your own uh, sphere. Uh, it's about organizing with them, organizing for food, organizing for energy support, organizing for various kinds of, of um, amenities and, and resources that they might need to, to get by and survive. Um, it's about also, um, if you're talking about research, I, I, I don't believe in the dichotomy between practice and theory because I think theory is practice in many instances. It's about what, who are you going to for your sources of knowledge about um, various questions and, and how do you, what questions are you ask, actually asking in that research? Because my work, for instance, draws upon plantation economy school of thought. How many people have heard about the plantation economy as a school of, you know, as a tradition in economics, right? It's about who you go to and where you go to for, for that uh, knowledge. Thank you very much for really detailed and yeah, informative answer there. I um, hope that's answered your question there, Bandile. I've got one here for Michelle. Would it be fair, so it's from Chris Carberry. Would it be fair to suggest that the focus of methodological individualism and utility within mainstream curricula has the capacity to shape the existing value systems, future behavior of economic students, and thus makes decolonizing and democratizing the curricula more difficult? Uh, I would say yes, <laughs> but more than anything, I would love it if people would not ask me questions, but rather just share their experiences and their expertise. Maybe that's a way for us to break down 
some of the hierarchies that they sometimes are in the webinars. Uh, but I would say that you're, you're almost giving the answer right in the question. Uh, so definitely, um, and I think this is part of what Kamal uh, was talking about, is that this idea of utility maximization um, of methodological individualism is so at odds with the economic and social realities that many students that are sitting in a classroom, at least in South Africa, um, are experiencing in their daily lives. Uh, and so because this, uh, I think, is perhaps better spoken of um, in philosophy departments, um, when one wants to offer almost any critique to this, uh, then you get told, well, this belongs in a different department and this doesn't belong within economics. Uh, but I think that it definitely has the ability to shape not just academics, but policymakers and community organizers and those that are going to be advising uh, politicians or politicians themselves. I mean, that really speaks to the power and the importance of us asking, how do we reclaim economics? Because there are times when I think to myself, well, we're so married to this idea, at least mainstream economists are, of methodological individualism as just one of the um, critiques that we have against mainstream economics, that maybe there isn't hope for economics anymore. Maybe actually what we need to do is um, kind of throw our weight in with other disciplines. Uh, but I would hope to not be as defeatist um, as that. Um, and to say that, you know, real uh, thorough engagement with that and a growing movement of people asking these critical questions and not just deconstructing, but constructing new ideas that challenge this um, is hopefully a way for us to begin to reclaim economics. Thank you. And we've got a question, a general question here. This is open to everyone. So I guess, Kamal, if you want to answer this one first. So Sarah Johannes was wondering um, about the title of the book, Reclaiming Economics, because the word reclaim seems um, like there was a time when economics was better or ours. Um, and she wondered if that was really ever the case. Um, so just wanted the speaker's thoughts on um, yeah, can 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 economics ever really be reclaimed? What does it mean to you to reclaim economics? So, Kamal, if you want to answer that one, um, I'm not really sure uh, how to go um, uh, about answering it. I mean, I think that um, there is uh, something to be said about the fact that it does need to be. Uh, also, I'm not sure about claiming or reclaiming. I do feel that a lot of the things that are said in the book, uh, I would hope to become part of uh, a mainstream at some point, you know, uh, and as soon as possible, you know. Um, and I wouldn't want it to become part of a mainstream that's kind of closed. I think that's one of the problems with our mainstream at the moment and neoclassical economics and its dominance and uh, some brands of Keynesian economics as well is, is it is closed. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, the kind of economics that we'd want as a discipline is one that is open to other ideas, one that transforms as our society transforms and as technology transforms, as, uh, uh, you know, all range of, of social relations transform. Um, but, uh, yeah, we do kind of want uh, our, our ideas to become part of uh, what is common, common knowledge. Uh, if that makes sense. Um, but this kind of claiming or reclaiming, I mean, isn't really a, a key focus of, of the book, I don't think. Um, does anyone else have any other thoughts on that? Uh, no, I, I was just going to um, suggest maybe I'm really keen for Dr. Perry to answer the question that has been posed to him about Adam Smith. <laughs> so. A slightly selfish part of me almost wanted to ask, could I cede my time to rather have him answer? Sure, go for it, yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Um, the question speaks to a certain context, right? So Adam Smith was not writing about freeing the enslaved peoples. He was not a writing about, because enslaved peoples and ex enslaved Africans were not considered people back in the eight, early 18th century, right? Or in the late 18th century, On, um, until we had the, the, the Haitian revolution. Even then, ha Haitians were not considered, uh, you know, full human beings. So that particular quote that was taken has, is a, and that's why it's important to study 
history of economic thought and, and, and his, his, um, the history of economics, because we have to consider the context and the historical context in which uh, economists and writers are you know, proposing ideas. Um, he was writing for a UK, British, English audience, and he was speaking to the tensions and the challenges that they were facing. He was, he was not interested in the West Indies to the extent that he was suggesting that um, they are so oppressed and, and they, 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 they have all these challenges, let's you know, try to address them. No. Thank you for that. And I just wanted to go back you know, to the previous question. If people go to, I think um, Tom Lyons has mentioned in a question, um, you know, in relation to was we, we economics ever for anyone more than sort of certain people. And this came up in the book as well about economics being a more interdisciplinary subject. Um, some people said it was from, you know, until the late 70s. So, so yeah, just have a look at the Q&A. There's a comment there as well about that. Um, it's a shame we, we're sort of running out of time, which is a real shame because there are lots of questions on here and um, we haven't really got through all of them at all, or is, yeah, hardly any of them. But um, just in case, yeah, people might have things to go on to. So I'd like to say you know, thank you for all your contributions to the speakers. Um, it's just been really informative. It's really shed a light, more of a light on the book um, and why, you know, why we decided to write it. So I want to say thanks to you. And uh, just to let you know that, um, yeah, we will put in the chats the website where you can uh, buy a copy of the book. And if you put the code RECLAIM30 in capital letters, you'll get a 30% discount. And we've set up a book website. So we want people to go to that website and there's some actions you can take now. And we've broken them up into if you've just got one minute free, you know, a couple of minutes, five minutes, and and certainly by all means, try and attend our diversifying and decolonizing action circles, which take place every two weeks. So you can, you've got ideas. So there's lots of ideas here in the Q and A section in the chat. I can see lots of people feeling passionate about these issues. So there are things you can do. You can, you know, and contact, use the contact um, emails there on the website, um, which will be in the chat now. So um, before I go as well, just in one thing from each speaker um could you let the audience know what one thing they could help you with to help you in the challenges in, in your you know how you teach economics and the challenges you face or how you engage with economics what one thing can the audience do okay. just give me a few seconds to think about that or if you're ready just unmute yourself and uh michelle yeah, just in the interest of time, uh, maybe the very first one uh, that pops into my head is just uh, don't be afraid um, to reach out, uh, to share your ideas, your thoughts, uh, whether you're a student, um, a community organizer, an activist, um, a student, uh, whether you want to reach out to anyone here that's on the panel today, um, or just looking someone up, just like, don't be afraid. And even if that happens to be your lecturer, right, to try to have some form of meaningful engagement with them, uh, whether you're Kamal, who's talking about labor economics to your lecturer, um, or, or just saying, I feel like there are some problems with the curriculum. Um, and I'd like to try to engage in a meaningful way, not meaning to necessarily critique you and acknowledging that it might be a really uncomfortable process for some academics who have never been taught themselves the types of things that you're, you're bringing to the fore. Um, but just seeing it as a, a hopefully a collaborative process and to not be afraid to use your voice because those feelings that you have as you're sitting here listening to this, they matter, they mean something, even though economists don't really want to ever talk about feelings. Thank you. And Kirsten? Um, I think one thing people can do um, is, I mean, the first thing that came to mind is read. <laughs> How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, right, by Rodney, um, Walter Rodney. <laughs> so um, that book is brilliant. Um, go to your community center, form a reading group, uh, join with others um, in your community, with your, with your family, and, and, you know, study the book and, and, and you know, just get out of, of 
your, your, your comfort and become uncomfortable in, in engaging differently. Okay, and Kamal? Um, I've been covered, uh, Michelle and uh, uh, Kirsten said everything I was gonna say. So yeah, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so yeah, thank you so much for everyone who's contributed today and to Laura, who's done a fantastic job with interpreting. It's just so nice to have a Spanish interpretation here. Um, so yeah, do visit the website and just keep those conversations going. Uh, we've got that as well as one of the things you can do, just just ask, you know, talk to people, ask your lecturers um, about how, you know, how we can help to make the curriculum more decolonized diversified and yeah we've got some upcoming events as well so that's all on the the website and somebody said about um i think michelle yeah you were saying you know you want it to be a two-way thing or, or have questions from the floor so we do have um an event it's coming up on the 2nd of march it's primarily for non-economists but we we're having it as a sort of a um, small group sort of meeting um exercise so people there will be much more discussion between the attendees and uh, some of the writers so um yeah if numbers allow then we, you can come to that as well if you want but we have to prioritize people who who are not formally studying economics for that one and then we have our our in-person launch which will be live streamed that's in london on march 22nd again it's all on the website so thanks again everyone um it's been really nice to host this um and yeah thanks for your all your contributions the audience especially as well as the speakers so thank you thank you for inviting me and thank you all of you lovely to see all of you from across the pond <laughs> thanks everyone okay, thank care. you very much Thanks so much, everyone. All the best. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.